This channel is brought to you by the family of Bill Britton. Written material may be ordered at BillBrittonMinistries.com. All of Bill Britton's messages are sent out for an offering of any size. This is a faith ministry made possible by the members of the body of Christ. We give God all the glory and pray He blesses this message wherever it goes. This tape contains a message preached by Bill Britton here at the House of Prayer in Springfield, Missouri on coming out of Babylon and going back to Zion. God bless you now as we take you into the service. Praise the Lord. I was reading in the 50th chapter of the book of Jeremiah, and as I read, I just want to make some comments on things I picked up there that are quoted in the New Testament, because this chapter is dealing with prophecies against Babylon and the land of the Chaldeans by Jeremiah the prophet. Now, Jeremiah the prophet was the prophet who prophesied uh, that the Babylon was coming down and going to take Jerusalem captive, going to waste the land of Judah and take them captive over into Babylon for 70 years. When it was not a popular message to preach, when uh, it seemed like he was almost a fellow traveler with the Babylonians, seemed like he was almost what we call today a communist living among us when he was adding his voice to the problems of Israel rather than trying to encourage them that they were going to win this war with the Babylonians. He was telling them, no, you're not going to win. You might as well give up. Now, that wasn't a very happy message, was it? In fact, it was so unpopular that the king, the government, decided he was a traitor and probably in league uh, with um, the king of the Babylon, uh, king of Chaldeans, and so he put him in a jail. One time they put him in a pit, a slime pit, with mud uh, in it in a filthy place. And then they got some old rotten rags lowered down to him, put him under his arms, and raised him out of the slime pit, and uh, finally sent him into jail for preaching that the Babylonians were going to be victorious. But before he's through preaching, he is now dealing with the end of the Babylonian captivity and the fact that the children of God are going to be coming out of Babylon, singing the praises of God and going back to Zion. Now, at the time of Jeremiah's prophecy, they hadn't even lost Zion yet. He was prophesying against them. In fact, he was there and during his prophecy, the, they were taken captive and he was left behind and uh, continued to prophesy about the terrible things that were taking place. In the book of Lamentations, he prophesies about how horrible it was during the captivity or during the war when Babylon came down and uh, killed the princes, took them captive, slaughtered the people, ravished the women, tore down the temple, burnt the city, uh, broke down the walls and destroyed uh, seemingly forever the ability of Israel to ever be a first-rate nation again among her contemporaries. And yet, in the midst of all of this, he began to prophesy how there was a remnant going to come out of Babylon and come back to um, Zion, and they were going to come back singing and praising God. The psalmist saw this in Psalms chapter 137, where it says, When the Lord turned again, that's 126 rather, when the Lord turned again, the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue was singing. And then said they among the heathen, The Lord hath done great things for them. The Lord hath done great things for us, whereof we are glad. Turn again our captivity, O Lord, like the streams in the south. He that goeth forth and weepeth, they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with the rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. This is one of the principles uh, that God has in the word, that whenever he puts his people down for chastisement, for correction, for judgment, there's always a bringing them up again. 
Hallelujah. For those whose hearts are turned towards God, there is no eternal down. There is always a lifting up. And so it is. And I, I thank God for that principle. It's working today. Did you notice today that we are a people here that are greatly afflicted with sicknesses at this present time? There has hardly been a Sunday that I can remember when we had so many of our own folks needing prayer and sick as there is now. I don't know if this has anything to do uh, or is, um, shall I say, has any relationship to the fact that uh, this much publicized film on Satanism, demonism, has come to Springfield. And I believe, though, that there is some of the advanced hordes of demons come to attack the strongholds of the people of God here in Springfield at this time. But I believe that if this thing is going to be defeated, its defeat is going to rest upon the faith of those people that are being attacked by it right now. Amen. And so I, I see not a continual putting down, but I see that as seemingly a great advance horde or an army um, uh, has come against the children of God, physically attacking them, uh, spiritually with depressions and oppressions attacking God's people. But I see that through this, as he always has, he brings his people back up, and the balance seems like higher than the uh, every time. Glory. I don't know if you ever saw one of those Super Bowls. It seemed like you drop it and it bounces higher than you drop it. Well, it isn't exactly like that. That would be perpetual motion, I guess, if you did that. But um, this is God's way, because his way is different from our way. When we are go down into the battle, into the valley, it seems like when we come out to the next mountain, that mountain's always higher than the one we saw before we went down the last valley. Amen. There's always a continual progress upward in God. Amen. Hallelujah. And the greatest thing that happened to Israel... The greatest thing that ever took place with Israel from the day that Abraham came out of Ur of the Chaldees happened after the Babylonian captivity and the terrible destruction of Jerusalem and the burning of the temple. The greatest thing that ever happened happened after that, and that's when Jesus came and visited his people Israel right here on this earth. Amen. Praise God. When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. Now, in the book of Jeremiah again, he says, In these, those days, and in that time, saith the Lord, the children of Israel shall come, they and the children of Judah together. Oh, I like that. The children of Israel are coming with Judah. Judah means praise. He was named because his name means praise. Hallelujah. And I see here in this scripture a reference to the fact that the children of God are going to come, and they're going to come with praises. Hallelujah. Now, with complaints... Not with uh, travail, not with sorrow, but they're going to come out of Babylon with the praises of God. Hallelujah. They and the children of Judah together, going and weeping, they shall go and seek the Lord their God, and they shall ask the way to Zion. And thank God today God is giving some men maps of the way to Zion. Hallelujah. Some men have a road map, how to find Zion, how to find the high place in God. And they're going to ask the way to Zion. And praise God for that. And it says, Remove out of the midst of Babylon. Go forth out of the land of the Chaldeans and be as the he goats before the flocks. Hallelujah. Some of these <clears throat> sons of God, some of these pioneers of faith that are uh, seemingly separating themselves from the systems of religion today, why people refer to them as a bunch of goats. They're not sheep, they say. They don't, they don't uh, follow after the traditional religions and uh, Christianity and all that. They're a bunch of uh, renegades and heretics and so forth. But he said, you go out and be like goats before the flock. Do you know what happens? Those he-goats that got out and the flock follows those he-goats, you see. And as the he-goats find their way, and they're good in traveling, they're sure-footed. 
Amen. And as they can find the paths to travel on, then the sheep begin to follow them. Hallelujah. And I believe God has got a bunch of people, he says, going out, says, go out like he goats before the flock. Go out and find some safe paths to travel on. In this rocky ravines, in these dangerous mountain passes, you find the safe paths to travel on, and he said, the flock is going to follow you. Hallelujah. All right. The voice of them that flee and escape out of the land of Babylon to declare in Zion the vengeance of the Lord our God, the vengeance of his temple. You see, the Babylonian system tore down the temple of God. They destroyed the true worship. They destroyed the true uh, ways of God in the church. But he said, God's got a vengeance against that, and it's the vengeance of his temple, and, and the voice of them that flee and escape out of the land of Babylon. And today, this voice is still crying Was it like it did in John's day when John said, Babylon is falling. Come out of her, my people. Amen. Lest be not partakers of her uh, sins, lest you partake also of her plagues. And so there's a voice crying of those that are fleeing out of the land of Babylon. And it said they're declaring in Zion the vengeance of our God. And thank God for that. And then over in verse 41, a great people, a people shall come from the north, and a great nation. Did you know you're a nation? Amen. In the book of 1 Peter, chapter 2 and verse 9, but you are a chosen generation a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but now are the people of God. And here he says, a people shall come from the north. This is the people that once were not a people. They were just part of that Babylonian system over there. But now he said a people are going to come from the north and a great nation, and many kings shall be raised up. What are you talking about, Brother Bill, about kings being raised up? Let me show you where he raises up kings. In the book of Revelation chapter 5, and verse 9 and 10, And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book, and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain, Jesus, and thou hast redeemed us to God, by thy blood, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Hallelujah. And the margin here says over the earth. That's where it is. It's here on the earth, and it's going to reign over this earth. We shall reign, ruling with him a thousand years. Glory to God. What happens after a thousand years? Brother, I'm anxious to use that up first. There's a lot of things beyond that. But this thousand years of ruling and reigning is glorious in God. And he says here, This people, many kings, shall be raised up from the coast of the earth. Their voice shall roar like the sea. They shall ride upon horses. Ride upon horses. The saints of God riding upon horses. Yeah. Let me turn you to the book of Revelation again. And look where they're riding upon horses. In chapter 19. And verse 11, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he does judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Now I guess we know who that is. Amen? But look at verse 14. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Now verse 8 tells us the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. In other words, if the fine linen, if this is symbolic language, and the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints, so that when these armies in heaven appear with Jesus, that it's not really fine linen they're wearing, but it's righteousness they're wearing. 
Amen? Amen? That means we don't have to have white robes on. Might have a business suit. Might have a sports shirt. Might have a green dress. Or a granny dress. Or something else, see? We don't know. That hasn't got anything to do. But they are clothed with righteousness. What about the horses? If I can believe that their clothing is symbolic, I can also believe that their horses are symbolic. And that speaks of authority in war. Amen. It's what kings rode upon. Today, everything is backwards. In the book of Ecclesiastes, I'll read it to you if I can find it quickly. If not, I'll just quote it. But in the book of Ecclesiastes, he tells us this. He said, I see an evil. There it is in chapter 10 and verse 5. There is an evil which I have seen under the sun as an error which proceedeth from the ruler. Oh, yes, the ruler has set this thing up. Nobody's done anything against the will of God, you see. God is not temporarily losing the battle. Ten points behind in the third quarter. No, he's not losing. He's not fighting to regain his supremacy. Brother, everything has happened. He is doing it. And he said, I have seen an evil. It's an error which proceeds from the ruler. Folly is set in great dignity, and the rich sit in low place. The rich? That's not us, Brother Bill. Oh, isn't it now? Hallelujah. What do you think Ephesians 3 meant when he says, Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And all I think of another one in Romans. Romans chapter uh, 11 and verse 33. All the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. The depth of his riches, of the wisdom and knowledge of God. Yeah, there's a people that's rich. But you know where they're sitting today? In low place. They do not have the government of this world. They are not ruling in the affairs of the world. That's why the world's in such a mess. If the rich were ruling this world, I mean those rich that have the unsearchable riches of Christ, if they're ruling in this world, we have peace. That's right. We stop these foolish wars and the crime and the famine and these other. But you see, it's the foolish, it's folly sitting in high places. Folly is set in great dignity. Have you ever seen any of these state affairs, pictures of some of the coronation of a king or a queen or... The inauguration of a president and how the dignity that they go through. Everybody dressed just so so with their uniforms and everything on, you know, and my, they're just so still and, and if the camera's on them, they're just standing just so, just so dignified, see. Nobody lolling around, their legs crossed or sitting up there reading a book or anything. No, no, they're in great dignity. What is it? Folly is set in great dignity. The men of this world who think they are so wise. The Bible says the wisdom of men is foolishness with God. Hallelujah. <laughs> now he says, verse 7, I have seen servants upon horses and princes walking as servants upon the earth. Uh -huh. I have seen servants upon horses. Those in the servant class that are not sons, they're the ones riding on horses. They're the ones that have the authority. But he said, I've seen those who are the real kings, the king's sons. See, these are the ones that are supposed to be riding on horses. This, because this is what it signifies, rulership and authority. But he said, I've seen them walking like servants upon the earth. Hallelujah. Now that's the vanity that he saw in what was going on in this world. But thank God there's a change coming for that. And over here, where was it? Many kings shall be raised up.
And he said, Their voice shall roar like the sea, and they shall ride upon horses. Every one put in array like a man to the battle against thee, O daughter of Babylon. Oh, yeah, we're going to fight? Yeah. Well, I don't know how to handle a sword. Well, join the club. I don't either. See? If they had rifles now, I could do better. But a sword? I wouldn't know how to tackle anybody with a sword. But here, this battle we're in is not with carnal weapons. What I said, our warfare, though we're in, live in the flesh, let me read it to you. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 or 10, chapter 10, 2 Corinthians, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not natural weapons, carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations. You don't have to handle a physical sword to cast down imaginations, do you? Hmm? But, oh, don't they war against us. And they get us depressed. And they get us oppressed when our mind begins to work and imagination begin to come in. And we begin to think, oh, this is against me, that's against me. I, I'm just, nothing's going to work right. And, and nobody loves me. And, and everybody hates me. And and I just go out somewhere and die, you know, and, and imagination begin to work. But casting down those things is a spiritual warfare. Amen. Hallelujah. But mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Yes. And he says, they shall ride upon horses, everyone put in battle array. I got to read Luke. I mean, Luke, I'm looking for Joel. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain, for the day of the Lord is come. Hallelujah. For it's nigh at hand, a day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. As the morning spread upon the mountains, a gray people and a strong. Here it is. Here's this people Jeremiah talks about. Joel saw them too. One thing these prophets had in common, all of the prophets from Samuel on down prophesied of this great army of God. Hallelujah. They saw it. They saw this man. They saw this army. Oh, they call them saints. They call them elect. They call them the son of man. Daniel said, I saw one like unto the son of man. Amen. And, but they all saw this corporate body of uh, sons of God brought into his image, clothed with the power of God. He said, a great people and a strong. There's not ever been the like of them. No, neither shall any more after to the years of many generations. Never been a people like them. Never going to be a people like them. This better be the people of God or we're in serious trouble. If there's a people on earth greater than the people of God ever become, we're in trouble. So this better be the people of God. And it is. Listen to it. It says, A fire devours before them, and a flame burneth. Behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the Garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. The appearance of them is of the appearance of horses, and as horsemen so shall they run. Hallelujah. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap, like the noise of a flame of fire that devours a stubble, as a strong people put in battle array. I just got to read another one about that fire and that stubble. I think it is in the book of uh, uh, Habakkuk. Hallelujah. No, it's an Obadiah. Obadiah, Jonah, make a name. Over. Here we are. I'll find it. Joel, Amos, Obadiah. All right. Got to locate it. All right, let's go back now. Joel. And what did Joel say about this people? He said, a fire devours before them, and a flame burneth behind them. He said, like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap, like the noise of a flame of fire that devours the stubble as a strong people in battle array. And then what does it say in Obadiah, verse 17? But upon Mount Zion 
shall be deliverance. All right. I've got to go back and read another. I'm tying all these in together here. But Joel chapter 2. I will show wonders in the heavens and the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Ha <laughs> ha. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance. As the Lord has said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. So here in Mount Zion again, we just can't get away from Mount Zion and this army and this deliverance and this fire this morning. He said, in Jerusalem shall be deliverance in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Now going back to Obadiah, but upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance and there shall be holiness and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. Let me turn you over to Ephesians chapter 2, chapter 1 of Ephesians. In verse 13 and 14, he says, or let's read verse 12. That we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. We have the Holy Ghost to keep us and to seal us and to keep us strong until we possess our possession. And it says here, the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. It's all talking about the same thing. When the Bible, the Old Testament talks about the house of Jacob, when it's talking about Mount Zion, when the New Testament is called about the saints that are filled with the Holy Ghost, all the same thing. Hallelujah. You link them together and you begin, begin to see what he's saying and the phrases and the words and, and the truth that's coming through is all one truth and it's all telling us one thing. If we can only see it. And the house of Jacob shall be a fire. Oh, what Joel say? He said there'll be a fire. Let me read that again. We kind of got away from that a minute. Listen, he said... Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap, like the noise of a flame of fire that devours a stubble, a strong people set in battle array. But upon Mount Zion, oh, the house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau for stubble. Now what is it that's being burned up? It's the house of Esau. What does Esau mean? Esau means a red man. It means uh, the natural man. It means the carnal man. It is symbolic of that Adam nature in us. The house of Joseph is symbolic and the Jacob is symbolic of the, uh, of the uh, Christ nature that's coming forth in us because he's bringing forth in us his Israel. Hallelujah. Jacob, the fruitfulness. And uh, here he said, Jacob shall be a fire and the house of Joseph a flame. And the house of Ephraim for stubble, and they shall kindle in them and devour them, and there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau, for the Lord hath spoken it. And deliverers or saviors shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Judge the Mount. Esau, well, doesn't the Bible say you shall not judge? No, the Bible says you shall judge. Okay? Let me read it to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life. Amen. You're going to judge the world? Oh, yes, saviors shall rise upon Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau. The works of the flesh, the carnal man, the Adamic nature is going to be judged, and all of that pertaining to that is going to be burned up in the fire of God. Now, you can hold on to the carnal nature. You can hold on to the habits of life. You can hold on to the appetites and desires of this world all you want to, but it's going to come under judgment. 
For there's a man rising up in the earth, a corporate man, a many-membered man, the body of Christ, that God is going to put judgment in his hand. Back to, jo uh, back to Jeremiah. And he says, They shall ride upon horses, every one put in array like a man to the battle against thee, O daughter of Babylon. The king of Babylon had heard the report of them, and his hands waxed feeble, and anguish took hold of him as pangs of a woman in travail. You know what scares the devil worse than anything? The king of Babylon. I mean the principality, the rules over the Babylonian system. I'm not talking about some fellow that was born uh, to a monarch over here in the Near East or in, the, in Asia somewhere. No, I'm talking about the principality, the rules over the Babylonian system. You know what scares him worse than anything? And that is to hear about this people that's rising up in battle array under the anointing of the Holy Ghost when a people comes to town with the anointing of the Spirit, the devil's knees begin to knock. Yes. Hallelujah. It said he's wax. What is it? He, his hands wax feeble. I believe, bless God, that when we give the report out there and the devil hears the report that there's a people that's walking with God and walking in the Spirit and abiding on the anointing and declaring the word of the Lord that the devil can't work as good as he, uh, or as bad, should I say, <laughs> as he normally would. Praise God. Why, I've seen cases where the children of God when something began to come to town, some satanic, demonic thing started to come into town, they would rise up and take dominion over that, and the whole thing would blow up, and it couldn't work. And I believe we're able to do that. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Now, we might be stirring up a hornet's nest, but I warn you, what might be happening because I don't expect any lasting casualties out of this. Like I say, the devil might make his attack, but bless God, um, he always attacks from the rear, you see, to kind of come in and catch those that are lagging behind. So if you don't want him to give you a few arrows, get up in the front. <laughs> Bill Martin used to say, he sat right on the front. He said, the anointing spills over on me there. <laughs> Praise God. I'm not talking about just the front of the front seat of the church. But um, when we heard about this film on the exor or exorcist, exorcism, why not? Which has nothing to do with real casting out of demons. As I explained to the class the other night, and I'm teaching a class at this present time in OTC about demonology. And I read nowhere in the Bible where in the process of casting out demons, a man of God was attacked and overcome by those demons. But this is what happens in the picture. And uh, two Catholic priests, I think, end up dead in this. And, and uh, uh, in the two that were trying to perform the rites of exorcism, they end up dead. And I don't read that in the Bible. This is not a biblical thing we're talking about, see? Right. But it is introducing a lot of people's minds, opening their minds to attacks of Satan, and people are going to the insane asylum. People are waking up in the night screaming. People are having nightmares. They are having all their fainting and everything else uh, as a result of seeing this thing. And I'll tell you what we have done. We have, pub, uh, we have printed... How many, Phil? 3,000, would that be 6,000 cut them? About 3,000 tracks on demon possession. And uh, we've got another run to do on them, I guess. The, the bright red title on it. And uh, some of them wanted to go over and pass them out to the people lined up trying to get into the theater. Hallelujah. So we may be stirring up a hornet's nest. We start getting. The prosecutor says he can't do anything about it. He don't believe in demon possession, and he said it's not obscene, and he can't do anything about it. But I believe the people of God 
can do it because when they begin to rise up in the spirit and in the anointing, the hands of the king of Babylon wax feeble. Amen. And he cannot do what he would like to do. Now, I'm not saying that we can drive this thing out of town. I'm not even interested that much in that. But I'm saying that I believe that we can prevent the devil from destroying people's lives through it. Hallelujah. He said, what do we care? They don't come here to church. We care. Whether they come here or not, we care. We especially care about you and warn you not to go see it. And no good can come of it. You won't get educated. And the entertainment you'll get will be a big price to pay for what, what happens to you. will be a big price to pay for your entertainment. All right. And pangs will come upon him like a woman in travail. Behold, he shall come up like a lion from the swelling of Jordan to the habitation of the strong. But I will make them suddenly run away from her. Who is a chosen man that I may appoint over her? Who is like me? And who will appoint me the time? And who is that shepherd that will stand before me? Who is it that's like me? Well, you know Romans 8, 29, where it says, There that for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Who is like him? Who is like the Lord? Brother, he is bringing forth a people, an army of people, that make up one corporate man that's going to be like Jesus in this earth. Therefore hear the counsel of the Lord that he hath taken against Babylon and his purposes that he hath purposed against the land of the Chaldeans. Surely the least of the flock shall draw them out. You want, I want to read you a Matthew chapter 10, I believe it is. Maybe it's chapter 11. Chapter 11 in Matthew. Hallelujah. And verse 11. Verily Jesus said, I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Hallelujah. I want to read in Hebrews chapter 2. I wear these Bibles out a little faster than most people. I turn a little get in a hurry. Chapter 2, For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof he speak, but one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man, that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man, that thou visiteth him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels, and crowned him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hands. For in that he, thou hast put all things under his feet, in subjection under his feet, for in that he put all things in subjection under his feet. Who? Man. The son of man. He said there is nothing that is not put under him, yet we don't see. But now we see not yet all things put under him, but we see Jesus crowned with glory and honor. So what do we see here? We see one that's coming. He says, who is a chosen man? Oh, he says, surely the least of the flock shall draw them out. I believe that God is looking for the least of the flock that will let him have his way in their hearts so that those are the least of the flock that he can manifest himself in. I've got to read one more scripture on that in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And he says, For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many noble, not many, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and the base things of the world and things which are despised as God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Hallelujah. There's our principle right there. God has taken the little ones, the least of the flock, to do the greatest works so no flesh can glory. Nobody's going to say, well, now, you see, if you would have been as strong as me, then... Uh, you might have been one of those rulers too. It is not based on who's stronger, who's wiser, who's noble. It's based on who will let him do his work through them. 
Well, I'd like to be one of those sons of God, but I'm just not big enough. I'm not able. I'm not uh, well-versed in the Bible. I'm not strong like you. Good. That qualifies you. That's right. All you got to do is let God. You turn it over to Him. Amen? Oh, praise God. Let me see if I can close out here and give somebody else a chance to minister this morning. He said, The Lord hath brought forth our righteousness. Come, let us declare in Zion the work of the Lord our God. The work. Oh, I've got to read the scripture in John. John 14, I think it is. Yes. He says, let us declare. Now, declaring is not just speaking something. What you do, what you are, speaks louder than what you say. And he says here in let us declare in Zion, that's the sons of God, the work of the Lord our God. All right, what does he say here in John 14 and verse 12? Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go to the Father. I want to go back here to the fifth chapter of John. Hallelujah. And he says in verse 33, You sent to John, and he bear witness to the truth, but I received not testimony from men. But these things I say, that you might be saved. He was a burning and shining light. You were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. But I have greater witness than that of John. For the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. Amen. What's he saying? He said, the works that the Father's put in my hands bears witness that I'm sent of God, and this is my witness in the earth. Then he says in chapter 10, the works, he said, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, he'll do also, and greater works shall he do. Oh, there's going to be a witness in the earth to the body of Christ here till nobody is going to be able to doubt it. Nobody's going to be able to challenge it that God's got a body in the earth doing his works. Hallelujah. In the fourth chapter and in dealing with the woman at the well, they came back and they brought Jesus some food. And uh, then they went out of the city and came to him. And the meanwhile, the disciples prayed and said, Master, eat. And he said unto him, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Has any man brought him all to eat? And Jesus said to them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Hallelujah. That's the food that he exists on is to do the will of God and to finish his work. You know, I really believe this is true today that a lot of people can eat they can stash in T-bone steaks and, and mashed potatoes and, and green beans and, and every good thing that you can find to eat and still be in poor health because the real meat of the life of the body is to do the will of God and finish His work. And I believe somebody who is doing the will of God and finishing His work can eat uh, bologna sandwiches and Coca-Colas and, and be healthier than the T-bone steaks right if we're doing the will of God and finishing his work hallelujah that's our meat that's our food that's what gets us to subsist hallelujah all right going back to Jeremiah make bright the arrows gather the shields oh I got to turn you over to Peter for this yes first Peter All right, 1 Peter 1 and chapter, uh, verse 7. I will read verse 6 also. Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season and need be ye are in heaviness, through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perishes, 
though it be tried with fire, might be found in the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Now, to tie that in with Ephesians chapter 6, where he says, We're on, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shot with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith. How do you get that faith? Oh, he said, the trial of your faith, more precious than gold, is going to stand in that day. And back here in, in Jeremiah again, he said, gather the shields, gather the shields. What is it? Brother, gather those people who have been through the fire. Gather those that have been tried like gold. Hallelujah. The book of Revelation says, let me read it to you. Well, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 18. I counsel thee to buy of me. Brother, this is not a gift. You hear me? This gold, these shields of gold, they're not a gift. You buy them. How? You go through the fire. There is something that's a gift. Salvation, it's a gift. Hallelujah. The Holy Spirit, that's a gift. But the shield of faith, wherefore you quench the fiery darts of the wicked, brother, you have to have some experiences with God to build up that kind of faith. You have to be willing to go through the fire. Praise the Lord. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. Gather the shields. The Lord hath raised up the king, spirit of the kings of the Medes, for his device is against Babylon to destroy it because it's a vengeance of the Lord, the vengeance of his temple. Set up the standard upon the walls of Babylon. Make the watch strong. And I believe this is a real witness to us here. He said, my watchmen shall see eye to eye when God brings again Zion. Amen? Oh, yeah. Thank God. And the closer we get to Zion, the more you're going to see ministries that will be able to flow together. Even though we may not yet see eye to eye, yet we're getting closer. And our spirits, there's a unity and a harmony in our spirits that are flowing together the closer we come into Zion. Make the watch strong, set up the watchmen, prepare the ambushes, for the Lord hath both devised and done that which he spoke against the inhabitants of Babylon. Thou art my battle axe and weapons of war. For with thee will I break in pieces the nations. With thee will I destroy kingdoms. Could I read you another scripture in Revelation? Glory to God. Revelation chapter uh, 2, verse. Now what does he say? You, Jacob, body of Christ, Saints of God, house of prayer, faith tabernacle, whoever you might be out there, you, you are my battle axe. You are my weapons of war. For with thee I will break in pieces the nations, and I will destroy kingdoms. Hallelujah. And it says here in Revelation, He that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end to him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my Father. The nation's going to be broken. Yeah, that's what he said. You're my battle axe. You're my weapons of war. With you, I'm going to break the nations. Hallelujah. Revelation chapter 12, you see a man-child caught up, and it says, she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And then one other verse here that came. Amen. He that overcometh and keepeth my works to the end. To him will I give power over the nations. Glory to God. All right. Thou art my battle axe. Thou art my weapons of war, for with thee will I be break in pieces the nations, and with thee 
will I destroy kingdoms. Yes, I know where, I was looking for another scripture. I know where it is now. Um, in in uh, Psalms 149. Amen. While I was preaching on one scripture, another one came through my flying through my head and it didn't roost. Just kept flying. I had to get it, go out and get it again. <laughs> All right. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud upon their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand to execute vengeance upon the heathen. See, this is vengeance upon Babylon. Same thing we're talking about in Jeremiah. And punishments upon the people to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron to execute upon them the judgment written, this honor have all his saints. You see, the kings that are going to be bound, it's not the monarchs in these foreign countries, these nations, the kingdoms that he's going to break with, a, uh, with his battle axe and weapons of war are going to be kingdoms in the heavenlies, thrones and dominions and principalities that are going to be cast down. These are the things God is really after. Amen. And this is the challenge that's set before us, and this is the job we have. And it seems like a big job for a little people, but if your God's as little as you are, you ain't got a chance. But if you've got a big God, you don't have to worry about how little you are. Praise God. Just go and rejoice in God, and don't get entangled with the depressions, with the weaknesses, with the battles that's going on in this daily life, but press on in God. Hallelujah. Do you feel an arrow st stabbing you in the back from the devil? Just say, bless God anyhow. Amen. Get your hanky out if it happens to be a bad cold or the flu or something. Say, bless God anyhow. <laughs> Hallelujah. And if it's in the family, if it's a problem, or, or somebody's down on you, just keep saying, bless God anyhow. Amen. This is the end of this message by Bill Britton on coming out of Babylon and going on to take Zion. Thank you for listening. We pray you were blessed by this message. For written materials or to leave an offering, please visit BillBrittonMinistries.com.